קוראים לי גבי מוצקין, אני ראש המכון, וברשותכם אני אעבור לשפה האנגלית. Good evening everybody, it's my pleasure to greet you. I'm Gabriel Motzkin, I'm the director of this institution, and my job is to preside at events. This is an event which I especially feel privileged to preside at. I sometimes wonder at such events who should be introducing whom, given the fact that it's rare that we have somebody of the eminence of Professor Bauman with us. Now, I think intellectuals basically have many functions, but I can think of two that are important. The first is to tell us what is happening, to be critical of the powers that be who too easily seduce us into the comfortable life. But the second is to tell us where we are, for we have little perspective on our own historical situation. And that function is no less important than the critique of the powers that be. Very few people combine both of those, Eminently, Professor Bauman has combined both of those functions. Now tonight, he is going to lecture us on crisis of agency or living through the times of interregnum. For if you wish to know, his lecture will be about 50 minutes. So compose yourselves. Professor Bauman, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when I'm uh, describing the present condition of humanity, a global condition, uh, using the term interregnum, what I have in mind is that the old ways of dealing with things, dealing with them effectively, are found not to be working any longer, while the new, more effective ways of dealing with problems have not been yet invented, invented and at best are somewhere on the drawing board, prepared to be articulated, but not articulated yet. And the, one of the most uh, conspicuous aspects of living under the conditions of interregnum, which we all painfully to greater or smaller extent experience in a virtually every country of Europe, but also in our other continents, uh, is the slow but steady erosion of trust. Erosion of trust in uh, the extant inherited from our forefathers who invented it, um, the, uh, the erosion of uh, the ability of existing political institutions, uh, I mean all political institutions, representative democracy organs, political parties and the whole surroundings of this system not working properly any longer. That's what I mean by erosion of trust. Uh, we don't expect, as uh, one of the American critics put it very nicely, we don't expect any longer uh, salvation from the state. Uh, your children or you yourself uh, are giving manifestation to this sort of feeling, going to the streets, occupying uh, the road Rothschild and trying to uh, find other ways of doing politics than institutionalized inherited ways. Uh, the fact is that uh, the political system as it does exist, mind you, I repeat, I mean political system, it's not just a question of losing trust in one or another political party, or suspecting one or another politician of corruption and inability, impotence, or whatever. But it is a question of lack of trust in the system as, as, as such, and its ability to face up to the realities of contemporary times and deliver, therefore, on their promise. And what I suggest to do, uh, that's what I want to dedicate my presentation to, uh, is to invite you uh, to join me uh, into consideration of the historical roots of this present predicament. How come, how we arrived here, where we are now. And I'm terribly sorry because I start from ancient times, which are not part of necessary uh, daily knowledge. Uh, I have to go back as far as uh, 1555. Uh, well, it is, uh, you know, considerably the uh, amount of time. Uh, in 1555, the representatives 
of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the France, Sweden, and some other uh, smaller dynasties ruling over Western Europe at that time, came together to the German town of Augsburg in order to find some solution to a very gory, very nasty, cruel local problem. Local problem of Christian Europe. Not a general phenomenon. Local internal affair of global of Christendom, which has been divided by Luther, by intervention of Luther, into Reformation forces and counter-reformation forces, and uh, was engrossed in murdering each other on a massive scale. The devastation made by religious war was tremendous, and the representatives of dynasties came to Augsburg in order to find some sort of a solution uh, to the ongoing uh, massacre. Uh, they came uh, out from the deliberation with a formula. Formula cuius regio eius religio, which means that who rules, he who rules, has the right to decide in what God his subject should believe. Very simple, very simple. Cuius regio, eius religio. Well, uh, it, didn't ho it didn't capture the imagination enough. It was too shocking an idea, really, at, the f at first. Uh, so it took almost 100 years more uh, to sink into the minds of influential circles of Europe that there must be something in it which perhaps, perhaps, who knows, God permits, it will bring peace on earth. Um, in the meantime, there was 30 years war long from 1618 to 1648, uh, war which destroyed um, approximately half of the population of German provinces, but uh, brought tremendously great, tremendously ample uh, human uh, uh, victims also in France and other uh, parts of the European continent. Uh, in Württemberg, for example, three quarters, three quarters of the population lost their lives in the epidemics which were caused by ongoing, incessant, continuous war actions. So, in 1648, there was another meeting of Western European powers, another meeting, this time in uh, Münster and Osnabrück, two other uh, German cities, and here the uh, principal cuius regio, eius religio, has been enthroned as obligatory on all powers, European powers. There were several subtopics co uh, contained in this formula. A uh, for, uh, topic, for example, of uh, sovereignty, of sovereignty. Uh, according to Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, sovereign, sovereign authority is exercised within borders, territorial borders but also by definition with respect to others who may not interfere with the sovereign governance. So it means on the one hand full power inside the territory ruled by a ruler, at the same time prohibition to all neighbors and any other force to interfere in these internal affairs of the place. New idea which was immediately afterwards uh, elaborated widely by greatest minds of Europe, like Machiavelli, uh, like uh, well, Luther himself, uh, Jean Baudin, Jean Baudin particularly uh, produced um, 18 years after, after um, that conference in 1648, um, the uh, tremendously influential, influential uh, book, De la République, uh, which became some sort of a Bible, not only for the participants of the European um, religious wars, but also for the future, and that is the point tremendously important, for the future builders 
of the modern nation state, allegedly secular nation state, not a religious <laughs> phenomenon, but nevertheless uh, taking over uh, the idea of uh, curious regio egus religio with one only little change, unspoken change, but very, very prominent. Instead of religio, what was put there was Nazi nation. New modern phenomenon, modern nation. Modern nation uh, which uh, may have been, have, have become uh, in the modern uh, era, in the, or the, in the um, era of the two parallel processes, nation building and state building intertwined with the idea of political state. They supplied the idea of national unity, supplied major legitimation on the ground of which the state uh, could pretend to have the right of demanding discipline to its decrees from its subject. On the other hand, the nation would be uh, toothless without a state, without a state because uh, as Ernest Gellner, one of the greatest anthropologists of the 20th century, pointed out, in the process of nation building, for every one nation which will emancipate itself into a state, there were at least 10 uh, competitors. And uh, only the one among them, one ethnic group, which managed to appropriate the, uh, the constructed um, the, apparatus of enforcement, of coercion. Max Weber defined state as an institution which has monopoly on the legitimate application of coercion. So if you have a monopoly, if you have a monopoly and you appropriate the state which has this monopoly, then of course all other languages of all other ethnic groups which occupy the same territory are, are recast as dialects which should be uh, you know, uh, removed by uh, the school curriculum. One or the general national language, one academy of language for everybody, one calendar uh, replacing the plethora of the local uh, traditions and local calendars of holidays and things like that. In every respect, you can use the state power of enforcement for a nation to feel safe at home at the expense of everybody else. Now that started, I repeat again, as a solution to the local problem created in Europe uh, after the religious schism, which divided uh, Europe between Catholics and Protestants. But then came the period of uh, European imperialism, European colonialism, Europe conquered all other continents, one after another, and whenever it came, it brought with itself this idea of the divine uh, marriage, well, ma marriage made in heaven between territory, nation, and state, which I call the unholy alliance, unholy triple alliance and which became, in the, in, the, in the long run, the cause, the major cause of most of the trouble which we uh, now suffer. Even when the uh, era of colonialism came to the end and Europeans started to be uh, kicked out or uh, withdrawing of their own will from the colonies, um, what they created were fictions of nation states. The boundaries between colonies, as you were known, looked very much like this famous road in um, um, uh, Afula, this uh, Derek Sargel. Uh, they just had nothing to do with languages, with religions, with tribes, with uh, et ethnic groups. Uh, just a pure fiction, um, uh, the result of the negotiation between generals of two different European armies, but now they became sacrosanct borderlines of territorial nation state. The result is the sea of uh, blood which has been spilled in the internecine warfare in all over Africa. You know, we all have been uh, witnessing that now. Uh, how costly 
this fiction has been. Well, uh, uh, then came, of course, uh, other developments applying to, uh, applying to Europe, Versailles Conference, Versailles Conference after the First World War, Peace Conference. And then uh, I think the idea of uh, Cuius uh, Regio, Eius Natio, had been brought to the culmination point by American President Woodrow Wilson presiding over, uh, over the Versailles Conference, who declared simply that it is the natural condition of humanity to be divided into nation state. So the uh, idea should be applied universally as a universal principle. Hannah Arendt, the name rings a bell, I am hope, I hope, uh, was appalled when, he, when, when, when she read about that because she said that a very big part of Europe, particularly Balkans, but not only Balkans, is a belt of mixed ethnicities. And the, the idea of territorial separation of nation politics and so on does not work under this condition. It may end up only in catastrophe. Well, uh, you know, in Versailles, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was reduced. The multicultural, multinational Austro-Hungarian Austri uh, Austro Empire has been reduced to the size of Yugoslavia. Well, Yugoslavia still could not apply this um, principle of one uh, state, one nation. And uh, the result of uh, Woodrow Wilson's suggestion we felt already in our times, not uh, uh, in the First World War, but now, after the Second World War, the uh, civil war which devastated a uh, great part of former Yugoslavia. Now the multiculturality, multiculturalism, mu multiculturality of the territory has been reduced yet further to both. And even then, it is tremendously uneasy the communities cannot uh, uh, easily coexist with each other, and uh, everybody expects another eruption of violence there. It, uh, the disruption of Yugoslavia, uh, uh, I don't know whether you remember or not, started from one very, very imprudent uh, in a moment of, uh, uh, well, I don't know, uh, distraction, uh, statement made by uh, Helmut Hall, uh, Kohl, the former Chancellor of Germany, uh, who said that Slovenia, Slovenia, one part of Yugoslavia, should be given independence because it is ethnically uniform. Just imagine how it should, how it could influence people who only waited to uh, cut each other's throats. It was as if confirmation, official confirmation fr coming from very high authority that if you want independence, please make some ethnic cleansing. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, ethnic cleansing, which uh, uh, costed quite, quite, quite a lot of uh, victims there. Well, <coughs> this idea of created, born, first in Augsburg and then repeated in two Westphalian cities, um, the Münster and Osnabrück, is still with us. We are living in the shadow of Westphalian settlement. It is binding. It is binding. It is written down in the laws of the United Nations. United Nations were created as a reaction to the disasters of the Second World War, to the atrocities, Second World War. So they, so uh, um, at the very beginning, United Nations were instructed to defend tooth and nail the inviolable, full sovereignty of every state over its subject. And no one should interfere. There are two particular articles in the Constitution of the United Nations which underlie uh, this issue. We are living, for all practical intents and purposes, under this condition, really. However, that's a very, very big however. Uh, however, uh, the situation of humanity 
the social setting of the world has changed beyond recognition since the time when individually sovereign territorial nation states could pretend they are that, that have that they have economic military and cultural sovereignty no single state in the world can actually realistically claim just that. No single state, even the most powerful of them. Simply because in the course of uh, globalization, which is uh, going on for al almost 100 years now, we are all interconnected now. The distances uh, separating one's safety and security and worrying factions now lost their defensive significance, their defensive meaning. Uh, we can act on distance, on enormous distance, on enormous distance in space and in time as well. So the independence, the separation, economic or, uh, uh, or um, cultural or military of a single nation uh, is pure fiction. It becomes fiction, more and more fictional day by day. While the institutions, the institutions, political institutions, meant to deal with the problems arising in the course of the human co cohabitation, are still living in the shadow of this idea of the territorial sovereignty of a nation state. So sovereignty, which uh, programmatically means also the uh, the desire, the, 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 the struggle for some sort of an autarky, self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency. Ladies and gentlemen, our interdependence is already global. I'm not saying, I'm, I, I'm repeating banalities. That's a fact of the matter which hardly anybody can uh, question. Our interdependence is already global, where us our instruments of collective action, concerted action, and expression of will are as before local. And stoutly resisting extension, infringement, and limitation. I call it in, uh, in our simplified uh, abbreviation, divorce between power and politics. Power, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the ability of having things done. And politics is the ability to decide which things ought to be done. Now, um, around, uh, uh, um, and, um, the, according to the Westphalian formula, and very much in the practice of 19th century, 20th century, it was like that, that power and politics were united in the hands of every nation state. Ability to do things and the ability to decide which things should be given preference over, other, over others. Uh, now uh, we are living through the divorce of the two things. Much of the power which was held by nation state now under conditions of globalization of capitals, globalization of finances, globalization of information, globalization of, uh, of culture, which moves freely over the um, in cross crisscrossing the globe um, informational highways. Now under impact of all that, plus the impact of international nature of terrorism, international nature of uh, criminality, the global nature of uh, uh, drug uh, pushing, the global nature of arms trade, and so on and so on and so on. Under all these influences, uh, we came to the um, situation in which much of the power which really influences our prospects of life, which, which really influences the prospects of our children to get employment, and to make a life career and to lead a decent life and so on, so on. But a great part of this power evaporated from the level of nation state up into the 
uh, cyberspace, into the global space, no man's land, free from politics. Because politics was left behind where it was 20, 200 years ago, in the localities, in capitals of the territorial nation state, which, according to the definition of sovereignty, have rule over their territory, but at the same time, uh, uh, the, the, uh, sign, sign, show the limit of uh, uh, of the uh, uh, decision of the of the obligatory nature of the decision made inside the uh, given nation state. So we have, ladies and gentlemen, a discrepancy. Discrepancy between power and politics. Whatever we have of politics. Uh, is not much to the power, uh, which is already much more extraterritorial. Extraterritorial. Simply, the locally based powers do not they do not match the enormity of the global powers. We have, ladies and gentlemen, at the moment on the one hand, powers which are emancipated from all political control. And on the other, we have politics, which is suffering constantly of deficit of power. And therefore, it needs to surrender many of its intentions. It is, no, it is becoming known more and more for not delivering on its promises, simply because there is not enough power in the hands of the political institution of the state to, uh, to see through uh, their intention. Well, now a little bit switched to a slightly different theme, but only slightly. Uh, what's happened in Europe? Well, very close to Israel, the Euro European continent, which was known of sovereignty being developed by every country by fighting its neighbors. Uh, Europe, in its, uh, most of its history, was known as arch master of, uh, uh, of uh, making enemies around. I remember from Poland, mind you, uh, before the war, I, I lived already before the war, I lived too long, and uh, I remember uh, being frightened as a child, among other things, by the fact that, uh, all, that Poland was surrounded on all sides only by enemies, not a single friend. Uh, the idea of crossing border, you know, without any, without any permission or special efforts, well, it seemed to be co completely fantastic. Uh, now, uh, after the war, people like uh, the Schumann, Bonnet, Spack, Adenauer, the Gasperi, who came together to create, first of all, to start from the kitchen, not from the public places, not from the public meetings, but from the kitchen. They started from bringing together coal and steel production. Uh, once that is brought together, then, ha, try to make uh, German tanks or uh, French tanks. It is possible. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the industries are connected. But anyway, the idea of, uh, of slowly, slowly, steadily unifying Europe and leaving behind the centuries of mutual enmity. Now, that was the idea which uh, uh, guided the minds and also the deeds of people who are, uh, whom I named. Um, and um, uh, uh, those people who supported them. The idea of building of a pan-European transnational solidarity which would unify the historically created and long established local solidarities which for hundreds of years reasserted their identities by stirring up and stocking the fires of discord among their neighbors uh, uh, with their neighbors new idea going beyond nation. Europe as a transnational, overnational institution, political institution, the first in history. Until now, until, until then, 
all uh, political institutions were national. Now, going beyond that. Experiment worked. Experiment worked. So, it worked in the same of in the sense of bringing peace and cooperation where war ruled before, but it was not accompanied for the nature of things, really, because I repeat once again, those wise people who created uh, uh, European Union entered the European Union on from the through the kitchen door, not through the uh, through the salons, because that would be absolutely hopeless. That would be wrong uh, place to to start. First of all, one needs to bring together to fuse the horizons of people by realities of their daily life, and then. You can develop uh, poetics, uh, romantics of solidarity, unity, loving each other, and so on. That's what they have done. And until uh, this very moment, of course, we all bear the consequences. Um, uh, uh, people are alarmed, and quite rightly so, that the economic unification of Europe was not followed by the development of European solidarity. European solidarity. The feeling that uh, identity, my first identity is European, for example, and because Europe is hospitable to every nation, to every language, to every culture, I feel at home in the League of Europe. Now, that is the still a question of future. Some people say it is impossible. They are too much used to the tradition of uh, uh, of bringing together identity, territory, and nationhood, that they don't believe that you can build a feeling of solidarity on any other basis as the ethnic differences, ethnic idiosyncrasy. One of the uh, most active promoters of the opposite idea is, um, as you probably know, um, uh, Jürgen Habermas, the great living uh, German philosopher, who coined the idea of constitutional patriotism. He said, uh, roughly, I am oversimplifying to make things shorter, that uh, uh, the, um, the patriot, pat patriotism, national patriotism, was not made in heaven. It was not the verdict of God who created the world, nor the verdict of history. It was just the human choice. That was the choice which accumulated over the centuries that there is no necessary connection between ethnicity and patriotism. You can be patriot of a humane, good policy of the good, humane state and be proud of being a citizen of such a state. And you can be a patriot of the laws which enable such a peaceful cooperation between the citizens. Well, we are, ladies and gentlemen, at the moment, transforming ourselves, even Israel is, thanks to the open border, as uh, my grandson informed me, uh, between Israel and Egypt, where the illegal immigration <laughs> went on and won and until the wall was built. Anyway, uh, everywhere we are becoming, day by day, diasporized. The number of diasporas uh, all over Europe is growing very rapidly, and every big city in Europe today is an, uh, an archipelago of diasporas. It's a new situation again, because strangers were coming, immigrants were coming to European countries for a long time. But the uh, guiding formula of treating the strangers was the idea of assimilation at that time. They assimilate, they want to be Germans. Okay, let them become Germans. Let them become indistinguishable from other Germans. Well, very often it was a bait. It was, uh, it was a very dangerous proposition. Uh, Jews of Germany learned the hard way how hypocritical this invitation was. But uh, nevertheless, that was the guiding formula, that was the ruling formula, assimilation. Surrender your own identity, which you brought with yourself in the uh, native country, and assume the local, ruling, obliging, uh, obligatory 
uh, identity. Assimilation is no longer on the cards. Uh, the um, Gastarbeiter, which came many years ago to Germany, um, allegedly and ostensibly at the beginning invited for five years, settled there. And they became German citizens, they acquired German citizenship, and they are allegedly very active in uh, German affairs, very loyal to the German states. They are, mind you, paying taxes more regularly than many other Germans, but nevertheless, but nevertheless, they don't see any reason why they should stop being Turks. They, con they consider that these two things, being an, a disciplined, patriotic uh, citizen of the country, does not quarrel at all with the fact that you keep your traditional uh, cultural identity. And that is just one example of what's going on uh, in Great Britain, where I live, and in France, and everywhere else. Assimilation is no longer on the cards, and that's how diasporization uh, differs from the previously known migration, simple migration. People change places, but together with changing places, they were expected to change their identities in order to earn the right to stay. The diasporization, according to all predictions which I am aware of, uh, is here to stay. Is here to stay. Uh, we simply, the European, uh, just to give you an example of the European Union, there are more than 400 million, more 100 million um, uh, inhabitants in the boundaries of the European Union, according to demographic prediction. Uh, by the next 30 years, it will, the total amount of population of Europe will be reduced to 240 million people, considerable fall, unless 30 million more immigrants from other continents come and settle in Europe. And if that doesn't happen, then 240 million, according to official estimate, won't be enough to sustain European way of life, which is allegedly very dear to all of us. Well, that's uh, roughly uh, one uh, predicament which is caused by the state of uh, interregnum. And the last question which I want to ask all of us to consider is whether that is the only, whether living in the shadow of Westphalian settlement is a, some sort of historical necessity, unavoidable, irreparable, we are doomed to that, with all the consequences which follow, uh, being exposed daily to this devilish, unholy alliance between territory, uh, ethnicity, uh, uh, and, um, and culture, uh, and, uh, and sorry, and, and the state. Um, or whether there are other ways. Uh, the South African, South African writer, great writer, great philosopher, Kötze, I very much hope that you, it's a very well-known name to you, uh, who uh, observed at close quarters the consequences of apartheid uh, in uh, South Africa, pointed out to us that uh, if we want war, we can go to war. If we want peace, we can live in peace. It's our choice. To a very great extent, he is right. And uh, I, as a sociologist, am in business currently trying to show how, to, how that is likely. I, I am, I'm not uh, uh, giving any recipes to you. I am I'm far from reaching any conclusions. But um, I want again to go a little bit back and see whether alternative ways of polycultural, peaceful and useful and mutually beneficial ex coexistence was possible. Now, the longest lang li li is existing empire in history, as you probably know, was Roman Empire. Roman Empire lasted 600 years, just imagine, 600 years. Why? According to Titus Livius, the secret was very simple. 
They didn't conquer the other territories and other peoples. They gave them the Roman citizenship. So instead of humiliating them and trampling on their heads, uh, they, on the contrary, they lifted their self-esteem. They became, they offered them the citizenship of the most, uh, the, 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 the largest uh, power on earth at the time. They adopted their gods, local gods. They put their uh, sculptures in the Roman pantheon. They elevi elevated the local, they didn't destroy the local gods. They elevated them to the co-gods, cooperating gods of the empire. And uh, that is why, that is why uh, the uh, Roman Empire, according to some opinions, uh, lasted so long. And according to the same opinions, it, brought, it was brought to an end by the imposition by the uh, Christian emperors, the obligation of one religion, of one religion. The first application of the principle of cuius regio, eius religio. But that was ancient example. Let me go to closer to our time examples. Uh, the place from which I arrived, uh, the former republic of two nations, Pol Polish and Lithuanian, which lasted several centuries in the cooperation in, and many f religious faiths, many religious faiths, many ethnicities, many tra cultural traditions were living, cooperating with each other and combining into setting in motion of the whole social political system uh, of, the, of the country. Um, well, um, that came to an end, that came to an end. As you know, there were three more powerful countries around Poland, and they divided Poland into three parts, and started poli policy of Germanization or Russification, depending on the place where they live. And this romance with uh, tolerance ended, ended abruptly. Ended abruptly, remember that Poland was, uh, with few other East European countries, was the only shelter away from the religious war which destroyed uh, the countries on the, uh, on the uh, west from River Elbe. Polish history is free from religious wars. Well, uh, it ended with the division of Poland between three powers, but uh, in other places of Eastern Central Europe, that experiment, that way of life, quite successfully existed for a relatively long time. One great European monarchy, close to the geographical center of Europe, resisted popular tendency, uh, popular tendency promoted by Western Europe, um, right up to the breakout of the First World War. This was uh, a country in which uh, very various ethnic groups and cultures governed from Vienna, and Vienna, not by accident, ladies and gentlemen, was at that time a cultural hothouse and a breeding ground of the most fascinating and far-reaching contributions to European philosophy, psychology, literature, music, visual arts, dramatic arts. And it was no coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, that precisely there, inside the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a person called Otto Bauer, you probably know him, a Viennese Jew, by the way, uh, published a, uh, a program for resolution of the national problem. A policy of cultural autonomy, policy of cultural autonomy. That means breaking the link between nation and territory. Wherever you go inside Austria-Hungary, you are 
preserving your identity. And, you, and your identity is serviced by the means offered by the, uh, by the uh, government uh, of the country. But there was another man, and I wonder why I didn't see any, a single uh, street in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem dedicated to his name. Vladimir Medem, Vladimir Medem, one of the creators of Bund, Bund, and ideologies of Bund, I hope you know what Bund was, <laughs> uh, not, not forgotten yet. Now, he produced a book, uh, which is called, in, by the way, produced it in Yiddish, in Yiddish, in 1904. Um, it was called, in translation, Social Democracy and the Rational Question. Madame proposed, among other things, I quote from him, that citizens of given nations unite into cultural organizations practicing in every region of the country, not just in one selected, separated territory, in every region of the country. And he also proposed that every citizen of the state belong to a national group whose choice be left to his personal preference rather than controlled by any administrative body. Well, I already told you what's happened to Austro-Hungarian Empire, what's happened to the, um, as a consequence of the uh, Versailles um, Treaty, Confer uh, Versailles Treaty Conferences. And um, uh, uh, I told you also that uh, uh, Hannah Arendt was appalled when she heard that the principle of nation state should be cuius uh, regio eius natio, uh, should be applied to uh, Balkan, uh, Balkans, which is the mi belt of mixed population. What follows from uh, my briefly and un un unforgivably briefly mentioning of the process of diasporization, we are all being transformed slowly into belts of mixed population. So, as it was un, unfit to serve the cohabitation of the original belt of the mixed population in the Balkans on the territory of Austro-Hungary, uh, it is becoming increasingly unfit to govern, to regulate our li life together under conditions of the bel belt of mixed uh, uh, population, mixed ethnicities, mixed culture, mixed languages, mis mixed religions. I would like to finish uh, in suggesting, ladies and gentlemen, that we can just give some thought to the possibility that the past of Eastern Central Europe, which I wish to present to you very, very briefly, in a very shortened way, that this past of the Eastern Central Europe may be the indication of the future of Europe, and not only Europe. Or the alternative e is that Europe, and not only Europe, has no future. Thank you. Professor Bauman has generously agreed to enter into discussion with you and to answer questions. And please be short and loud because we are both hard of hearing. Oh, both? Oh, thank you. Welcome to the club. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yes, sir. Stand up and loud. <laughs> you said in the beginning of your talk that the microphone ah, even better. No, there is no, yes. no passage. You said in the beginning of your talk. I will, I will, yes. Watch I'll, out. I'll, That's I'll, very I'll, steep there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You said in the beginning of your talk that power was evaporated was is now in no man's land. 
But isn't power just concentrated in the ends of a few global organizations or people, and not just in the virtual space, which no one really knows where it is? Well, I can only repeat what I already said. Uh, the organization with logos are uh, uh, easy to describe, and they are profusely described, but there is quite a lot of clandestine globalizations, which is much uh, more difficult to, to capture. Well, the problem is that we are, I, I spoke about globalization. It is not exactly a precise uh, term. It may be misleading because uh, we have not a global globalization process in front of us, but what I call the negative globalization, which is not supported, not followed by what I call the positive globalization. What I mean by negative globalization? Globalization of forces which specialize in ignoring local custom, local preferences, local laws, local expectations, and so on, which cross, who cross the boundaries between states at ease without, uh, without asking permission, and uh, which in all other respects undermine even further the uh, alleged sovereignty of the country. What are these forces? Uh, such forces which ignore the local preferences, local customs, local expectations, or whatever. They are, I, I repeat, um, uh, uh, financial capitals, investment capitals, uh, uh, commodity, commodity trade, um, information, of course, um, but uh, cultural offers of all sorts, uh, which come to you from the screen um, of, um, of um, uh, your um, laptops or uh, notebooks, uh, gray, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, with the help of Mark Zuckerberg, who uh, created Facebook for your users. Uh, so you have uh, so uh, these forces ignoring and undermining sovereignty of every local um, body uh, are already globalized together with other similar, in this respect, similar uh, um, powers, like power of criminality, power of mafias, power of uh, drug trafficking, power of um, uh, arms uh, trade, and so on, which also behave exactly in the same way, and we had, which has also, have also developed vested interest, vested interest in undermining and ignoring and neglecting the differences between different nation states, different territories, different populations, populations or whatever. That's negative, um, uh, ne negative um, globalization. And I mentioned that positive has not yet started in earnest. What I mean by positive globalization is the attempt to remarry power and control but this time on a global level, because remarrying them on the local level is no longer on cards. Creating truly global institutions of political control over caprices, over, uh, over surprises, which are constantly created to all of us by these free floating in the cyberspace powers. Now, uh, we don't have a single truly global institution. We don't, don't, uh, don't confuse, please, global politics with international politics, because international politics is, in actual fact, an intergovernmental politics. Some ministers come for a few days together to Davos or other places like that, very pleasant places otherwise, and, uh, and make uh, ad hoc <laughs> agreements uh, to resolve one issue which, uh, which, uh, which uh, worries uh, them all. But uh, their decisions have no legal power. They have no legal power. Just imagine in Jerusalem, uh, there, was a, uh, uh, there were rules for the uh, uh, street traffic which say that red light is the, on red light you must stop if you sign the convention. 
But if you didn't sign the convention, you are free to move wherever you go. Just imagine how nice it would be life in Jerusalem. But that's exactly the situation on the global scale. We don't have global institutions able to uh, oblige uh, the world to uh, renounce on certain harmful, uh, victimizing procedure which they uh, uh, resort to. I put myself next on the list, and I think we have a series of questions. Uh, uh, writing them down. Here's my question. You t portrayed a wonderful uh, utopia of mixed populations and universal rights. Because obviously, in that kind of situation, you would have to have all national groups be equal. But in Austria-Hungary, that wasn't true. As you know, the Germans in the part that was Austria had the upper hand against the Czechs, the Poles, the Ruthenians, the Slovenes. And the Hungarians had the upper hand against the Croats, the Romanians, and all the other peoples. And that's just not even beginning to say how many groups there were. So you, uh, And if you think of the Turkish Empire, the same thing arose. In other words, the centers of power were manipulated by a dominant nationality in order to continue its control. Now, how are you going to prevent that from happening on a global level? Well, if you have a bed of roses, you must to agree to thorns, because there are no roses with, without thorns. Yeah. Uh, there was an attempt to make uh, a cohabitation uh, possible under conditions of being surrounded by uh, all other territories in which the Westphalian formula was uh, almost treated like part of the Bible. It is you no know, divine decision or historical decision. You can do not pretty nothing about it. No wonder that people looking on the, on the, across the border uh, could uh, uh, dream about applying to themselves if once they got the superiority over other nations, relative superiority, um, uh, to expand their influences at the expense of others. That was the way in which things have been done in Europe, throughout Europe, until, until Europeans can, yeah, as they do now, move uh, you know, uh, uh, easily from one country to another, find employment where, where there is employment waiting for them, where they can develop their abilities to the best. And retaining their nationality, retaining their identity. There are over one million of Poles in uh, Great Britain today. Polish language is already the second, uh, from the point of view of number, language spoken on the British Isles, already second. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that to some degree, the Poles who settled on British Isles anglicized, but they are also at the same time polonizing the landscape of Britain. If you go to London today, if you remember London 30 years ago, you will find a different London change very considerably by the influx of Polish uh, educated people which brought their skills, which brought their ideas, and which contributed, in fact, tremendously to English survival, economic survival, <laughs> so to speak. Thank you. Uh, Professor Radai. Um, thank you very much. Sorry? Thank you very much for such a fascinating, um, yes. can you hear me? Yes. For such a fascinating talk. Um, fascinating. The part that I found difficult to follow was your criticism of the nation state as a solution to um, internet time warfare. And you pointed out Africa. I hear many times, I work in the United Nations, where it's said that the, all the, the fighting in the internet time warfare in Africa is a result of colonialism. But you, in your exposition, showed that the origins of the nation state was in dealing with religious what? wars. What was in dealing with religious wars? Was the origins of the nation state was in dealing with religious wars. Was, it was, it was in dealing with religious wars. And um, tribalism actually is not new after colonialism uh, and tribal warfare. So, um, I mean, this is an even more pessimistic view in my way, in my, my way of thinking, is that when you go down to the local and the tribal, 
um, you lose some of the benefits that the nation state brought in terms of human rights and welfare. Uh -huh. And, I, and, and I, I'm not quite sure how to phrase my question to you in that respect, but I, 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 in your presentation of the development, I felt that uh -huh. you were, to some extent, if I may say so, um, romanticizing the, the, the pre-state uh, situation. Well, if you, if you imply that uh, things are ambivalent, I agree with you entirely, because all institutions were so far invented <coughs> but hu by humanity in its long history were ambivalent, could be turned one way or the other. But the fact is that uh, uh, the, the, the collapse of colonialist system in Africa is already 50 or even 60 years long. And uh, during these 50 or 60 years, uh, there were millions of Africans which were killed in civil wars, which were created, among other things, by the fact that uh, completely figments uh, of imagination, the imaginary boundaries, leftovers of the colonial practices were suddenly declared to be the boundaries of the nation states. Boundaries of the state, okay, but also boundaries of the nation. One nation, one state. Uh, pure figment of colonial imagination. The uh, fact that there were genocides, they were, that civil wars are still going on in some part of the Africa, that quite a few uh, states inside Africa already collapsed as states and are quasi-states, are uh, not working, ineffective states. Now all that is the product of applying imaginary artificial solution to the real genuine problems of the place. Now, uh, the globalized, even the positively globalized uh, planet uh, will be highly differentiated, will remain highly differentiated. I'm not suggesting that uh, on the card is a global culture. I think it's, it's unthinkable. I think that uh, humanity will be collection of diversities, of diversities. It will remain like that. Uh, and uh, I am pleased with this vision, actually. Excuse me, I, I quote again Hannah Arendt. Uh, Hannah Arendt wrote a beautiful essay on, um, uh, on uh, uh, men uh, in dark times. Well, she described our times as dark times. In darkness, you see only a few inches in front of you, <laughs> but what is far away, you can't, you can't see. So that is a very good metaphor. But one of the essays there in this book is the essay on uh, God, uh, God, um, God help uh, Ephraim uh, Lessing, one of the pioneers of German enlightenment. And uh, uh, Anna Arendt adored him considered him one of the greatest minds of in history. Why? What, is the, what was the argument? First of all, he was the first philosopher of enlightenment at the time when other philosophers of, of enlightenment uh, anticipated unification, universalization of the Western um, yeah. patterns of cultural life. He was the first to have the courage to acknowledge that differentiation of humankind will remain with us permanently. It is irremovable. But not only that, she praised him also for the fact, and pr predominantly for the fact, that he actually enjoyed the prospect, this permanence of diversification, because it was his deep, deep conviction that the situation of differentiation when many people have many different contributions to bring to the common dialogue, to the common negotiations. Now, this situation is the indispensable condition of creative activity of human beings, of all human creation. If not for that, if not this you know, clash of differences, if not this uh, uh, diversity of the solutions offered to problems, we will be probably sitting somewhere in the Paleolithic times, 
not in one year beautiful building, but uh, in caves. Dr. Bashir. Okay. Uh, in line of uh, your analysis, uh, uh, I would like actually to stretch the scope uh, uh, and extend of your analysis and move it from being a little bit Eurocentric uh, to, to bring it more to the elephant in the room somehow, and that is Israel-Palestine. Uh, and if, if I were to take your analysis, and I would agree with large extent of your analysis, um, I think there are some, some ways to problematize your analysis, but if we were to buy into your, your, uh, your thesis, uh, which suggests that there is a new grammar of politics and power that is emerging, which is largely breaking up with the Westphalian uh, tradition and paradigms and moving to a new post-Westphalian paradigm, through which at the center of that we are inviting to rethink sovereignty, self-determination, partition, territoriality. So if we were to observe that one of your main suggestions is that we are actually becoming more and more intertwined and we are becoming interdependent. That's basically one of the main lines of your argument, as well as that one of the things that you were suggesting is the previous paradigm, i.e. the Westphalian paradigm, was premised exclusively on the paradigm of partition. If we bring this into the context of Israel-Palestine and take Jerusalem where we sit right now, which exemplifies the microcosmos of historic Palestine in which the Arabs and the Jews are intertwined by they actually separated and governed by basically oppression and discrimination, then what is your account on basically the tyranny of statehood that has been and the paradigm of partition and the two-state solution that has been governing and policing the politics of Israel-Palestine for the past 30, 40 years? Thank you. He wants to know how your what paradigm... The question? the question is, how does your paradigm, how does your paradigm apply to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and how would you see, you know, your paradigm applying to this? Uh, okay, everybody. Professor Bauman understands the question, so let's hear his answer. Please. Uh, well, uh, I can admit that quite recently I was, uh, I had a dream, and which I consider to be a nightmare. I was, uh, I woke up uh, covered with sweat, really, uh, and the dream was that I was called to join the government. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I uh, I share your doubts. I share your doubts. It, I am not pretending that uh, I, I'm far from even imagining. Not 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 just daring to pretend, but imagining in my, deep in my heart that I have a solution, which is free, which is flawless, uh, which is free from uh, uh, well possible. Uh, uh, protest, uh, dissent, that it wouldn't work. Uh, it is not uh, is a road leading nowhere. That's right. Every proposition you make here is not free from some dangerous aspect. That's an absolute question. But no wonder that it is like that, because we are almost 60 years after the beginning of occupation. So what would you otherwise expect? Would you would you, would you expect a straightforward road to, road to peace? Facts have been done. Something happened on both sides. Uh, what I call, after Gregory Bateson, the schismogenetic, schismogenetic chain, namely the uh, policy on both sides of the barricade guided by the principle, whatever you do, I can do better. You can pain me, I can pain you even more. Now, that sort of a politics is unfortunately leading nowhere to mutual destruction. And the only way of, sa of saving our lives, uh, of saving our dignity, of saving our humanity, is to cut it at some point. For the time being, the logic of coexistence and in under condition when one coexistent occupies the other coexistent uh, is such that uh, it leads to less and less communication on both sides. I protested against the wall simply for reasons that it is a symbol of the breakdown of communication, breakdown of dialogue. If you build an eight meter uh, high wall, 
what you want to announce to the world, I have nothing to do with you. I'm not listening to you. Uh, what, who is on the other side is irrelevant uh, to whatever I'm going to do. Now, we created this logic of self-enforcing enmity. Instead of creating the beginnings of self-promoting, self-enforcing, self-propelling uh, negotiation and agreement. It's very easy to say that it looks hopeless. Luck, right, we have made it complex, uh, hopeless. I agree with that completely. And under this much worse, much more difficult situation than they were 50 years ago, I think we should at least belatedly, but try to engage in a dialogue. The, um, the uh, Ma Odo Markart, the uh, uh, German philosopher, very great philosopher, living currently and writing currently, and I advise you to read uh, his books, and first of all to translate into, into Hebrew. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, well, he pointed out that if there is one truth, one truth only, proclaimed by each side, confronting each other, then it will come to fisticuffs or to the bloodletting. But when there are two truths, that means assumption, assumption that maybe my raison d'etre is not the only one, perhaps I am not entirely uh, in the right, perhaps I'm, I, I am mistaken, perhaps the other side has some wiser solution to the problem. Now people come instead of shooting each other, to talking uh, to each other. And even jokingly, Otto Markart uh, derives, uh, derives the uh, word of Zweifel, German word of Zweifel, from the word Zwei. And he said, well, when there are two <laughs> equal partners, then the doubt arises, and when doubt arises, that you don't have the arrogance to press your own unique, in un, 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 uh, unshared wisdom. <laughs> you okay? The gentleman in the back. Yes, that's you. Does he have a mic? Can we get him a mic? What about finish? Oh, we, we have two more, and then we finish. Hi. Um, my question is, uh, I agree that there's a lot of um, economical and uh, political power um, in the global level beyond the reach of uh, governments, like you said. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> there is a lot of, I, I, I agree that there's a lot of economical power beyond the reach of governments because of globalization. But if you look at the social protests in Israel, and if you look at, uh, for example, Occupy, uh, I, was pr I participated in Occupy in London, um, people were only talking about national solutions, or mainly. Most of the people were talking about national solutions. And my question is, why? And uh, maybe another short question. I know that there were a lot of people that called you to boycott um, this lecture, not to come, because Van Leer is an Israeli institution, and I wanted to ask why you, my friends, that didn't come, this, uh, asked me to ask you why you decided to, to come and participate. Right, uh, should I uh, now? Uh, two days ago or yesterday, the uh, uh, Congress, annual Congress of Israel Theological Association ended. I, I gave the keynote there uh, three days ago, and exactly on this topic. Uh, it was a long uh, uh, lecture more than one hour long. You don't expect me to repeat it now. <laughs> but um, really, I agree with you completely that one consequence of the 60 years old almost occupation is the fact that Israel neglected its social problems and allowed it to accumulate, was busy with something else completely, shifted quite a lot of funds, the equivalent of the total amount of uh, dedicated to education in Israel, the total amount dedicated to health service, 
uh, in Israel shifted equivalents of that to military purposes. Military purposes, but the second consequence, even worse than that, that because of the constant state of war, constant state of emergency, and constant <coughs> fear emerging out of the state of emergency, the political elite in Israel forgot how to deal with social problems in any other ways, apart from continuing military action. There are skills, there are ways of repairing the poverty. There are ways of lifting people out of their poverty. The one uh, million seven hundred uh, seven hundred seventy thousand Israelis, Israeli citizens live at the moment in poverty. Eight hundred fifty thousand Israeli children uh, uh, doesn't have enough to eat and misses at least one uh, one meal a day. Now that is the situation. On the other hand, you have narrowing all the time, very top, uh, consisting of several families, elite, financial elite, uh, elite of riches in Israel. My uh, uh, lecture, which I gave to the uh, 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 Congress of Israel Social Association, was a rhetorical question. Does riches of the few benefit us all? Of course, the rhetorical question, because the obvious answer is that no, no, they don't. <laughs> they don't. But uh, if you want a larger, larger uh, argument supporting this idea, you would have to call another uh, Congress of Israel Sociologists. <laughs> We're going to take two questions together very short, because Professor Bauman is tired. So first the gentleman in red, and then the gentleman in the front. You've withdrawn, so just you. OK. Yes, just you. But short. Uh, as a Polish to a Polish, I, I think we should both be worried about the Polishization of England. But uh, regardless of this, uh, I, I would like to actually, I would like, to, I would like to actually uh, come into dialect with uh, the question on the left, which was given about uh, the state of empirehood happening in the world now. Basically, what we are seeing, what we are seeing now is Europe becoming a new model of a United States, of, what? of, of a United, United States, States uh, very successfully, if, if I m may add. Uh, China is, is China, India are India, basically civilizations. My point is, we're seeing that South America and Africa are actually implying the national model that Europe applied uh, throughout the centuries, and the Northern Hemisphere, including India, is actually starting to resemble the empire model of the early Middle Ages. My question is, how would you conclude uh, this uh, political uh, happening? Where will it lead us, basically, in South America and in Africa? That's my question. Thank you. The non-simultaneity uh, of different traditions. Look, I'm a humble sociologist. You don't expect me to be omniscient. You are asking me about, in one question, about China, India, Brazil, probably South Africa, <laughs> and the rest of the world, universe, and its surroundings. I, I really am not able to give you a competent uh, uh, answer. I am, uh, I am really trying very hard to confine myself to things which I thought through, studied, researched. <laughs> And that uh, I can responsibly answer. But it would be, it would be a very bad policy on my side if I take, uh, if I, uh, to start with, uh, pretend to be one of the Nevi'im, you know, biblical Nevi'im, <laughs> having the gift from God to see the future. I, I mean, you said we're going towards a certain think, direction. Just, so. just, just please. Uh, oh, sorry, I refuse to answer this question. <laughs> okay. Well, we thank you all. I wish to remind you that there are, you can also go out through these doors and not only through the back doors. You'll get out more quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. You know, it's, uh, thank you for doing us the honor.